Hello, Heather. If you can see us, we can see you. <laughs> no, we cannot see you. Guys? Can you hear me? All right, we do have a picture, but I can begin, right, uh, and introduce the subject. All right, so this session will be about climate change, the EU and the world. Uh, climate change is of course the EU, but the concern is the following. If you have a climate change, a climate change is a global issue, and the carbon emissions do not, do not uh, really know um, country or region. It's, uh, it's in one atmosphere, it's one uh, carbon loads in the environment, and uh, unless we do work together as a global community, we can't really achieve our net zero uh, targets uh, on time. Uh, so our discussion will be focused on this one. Our speaker, our speaker, our speaker, our speaker. Uh, Grappe. Heather is a uh, non-resident fellow at Bruegel and also visiting uh, professor at UCL, the um, uh, University of London, and advisor to the European Policy Institute in Brussels. Uh, she has a PhD from Birmingham. She reads at Oxford uh, philosophy politics and economics, 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 and, economics. Uh, her focus is on, uh, of, of her work is on the political economy of the European Green Deal and uh, climate transition. Sure. Sure. So the plan sure. for sure. this session, as for the previous one, would be to give Heather uh, some time, 10, 15 minutes to introduce the subject, and then we'll follow up with the conversation and uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. So Heather, so Heather, so Heather, so Heather, so Heather, so Heather, so you can hear us, you can, uh, you can begin. Uh, years, particularly since the 2019 European Parliament's elections, is the way that um, climate policies have gone from being one uh, set of policies among many and just one economic concern among many to being much more prominent and having risen up the list of priorities. Um, that's because the scale of the challenge is big, becoming much more evident in political and economic terms, but also in physical terms. None of us can uh, be unaware now of the physical impact of climate change after this summer of extreme heat, extreme temperatures, wildfires, um, floods and, and drought, of course. Um, and the impact of that on our economies is begun, beginning to become clearer that there are costs of going net zero and there are enormous costs of not going net zero and that's also becoming something that is being factored much more into economic policy debates um, and climate has also moved from being something of a protective agenda really which is about preventing harms preventing harms to the environment and preventing harms to humans but also now into a transformative agenda for economies and societies because it's quite clear that um, a net zero economy or a low carbon economy is going to look somewhat different from the economies we've had before, which presents enormous opportunities for investment and for positive changes in a lot of sectors. But it also means that um, we need to start adjusting all kinds of policies to take account of the fact that different kinds of economies will come out of this, uh, this transition, this transformation, um, which will need to be sustained now um, over uh, several decades. So um, the first thing to be aware of, um, which I think is really key in, in considering how it will affect economic policies, is it, the thinking about this as a system change. It's a change from a system primarily designed to uh, promote GDP growth um, and one that is primarily um, focused on economic efficiency to one with a great deal more resilience that needs to be built into it and one in which uh, there will definitely be old industries which are being phased out and new industries which are coming in. We already see that happening. Um, but how that makes um, this era different from previous ones is a really interesting question. It is going to be something um, on the scale of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and for that reason, it's actually, I think, in some respects, going to be uh, a bigger set of issues than we've had to deal with um, within living memory in economic policies. So first of all, the shift in priorities. 
Uh, clearly, we're going to see a shift um, to much more concern about security and resilience. This has already begun when uh, it comes to supply chains, because, of course, uh, concerns began to, to rise during the COVID pandemic, as we discovered the vulnerabilities that long supply chains give us. But it also means changes in value chains, uh, because um, as renewables are built on a much larger scale, it's likely that a fair amount of industrial production will move to where the energy is being produced, because it's renewables um, Produce, can produce abundant energy um, at low cost once they've been built. Um, but it's, of course, much harder to transfer their energy over long distances. A barrel of oil can be put on a ship and uh, shipped around the world at relatively low cost and provide an extremely energy dense um, uh, product uh, per unit. Whereas um, renewables primarily produce electricity, which is uh, much more efficiently used at source. So that suggests that quite a lot of industrial production will move to where the energy is being made, which is good news for countries with abundant sunshine and quite a lot of wind like Cyprus. Um, but it means a rethinking of where industrial production is located. It's a new map a new industrial geography. Um, whereas for the past several hundred years, uh, we've been used to having industrial production happening near what were the sources of energy in the 18th or 19th century. Um, and then governments have um, expended a lot of um, effort and, uh, and a fair amount of public money in keeping production in those same places because there are political constituencies of workers and and indeed of capital owners who wish to maintain production there. This could change quite a bit as production moves towards where the energy is made most plentifully. Um, now, some of that will still be in, for example, the North Sea, thanks to all of the North Sea, the offshore wind that is being produced, but it will also move um, to where the sun is more abundant. Um, and, and that's a, a change that we need to be taking into account when it comes to uh, economic policies. Um, the second um, issue that comes up when it comes to resilience is, of course, concerns about dependency. At Bruegel, we've been doing some work on how you would go about de-risking the European economy while decarbonizing it. And it's very hard to get away from our enormous dependencies on China uh, because uh, China not only supplies most famously, and you've all seen the graphs, um, a huge proportion of the critical raw materials uh, which are needed for uh, clean tech, but also the processing of those materials and increasingly the innovation and the manufacturing of the finished products. So the recent uh, anti-subsidy uh, investigation announced by President von der Leyen uh, with regard to electric vehicles from China um, is getting at part of the problem, which is subsidies and uh, very different um, access to uh, low cost capital in China from that in Europe. Um, but the finished vehicles of, of the that are being um, shipped from China to the EU are just part of the story. There's actually a whole supply chain behind that of the batteries, of many of the components, of the processed materials and of the raw materials. Um, and that means that it's hard for us to, uh, to de-risk while continuing to decarbonize and for example, bringing in electric vehicles, because um, China can retaliate um, against uh, measures that we take to try to, um, to reject unfair competition. And in particular, China can uh, retaliate on intermediate goods, uh, which are really fundamental to particular technologies that we need, but which are relatively low value in the entire um, uh, value of trade with China. So that makes it hard for us to respond to China uh, like for like. Uh, the dependency is there to stay. It's something we've got to, to work around. It's something we're going to have to live with um, while continuing to decarbonize. And in a forthcoming Bruegel paper, um, my colleague Alicia Garcia Herrero and I will put forward some ideas about how to build some supplementary supply chains uh, to those uh, dominated by China in order to, to de-risk uh, the dependency more effectively. Um, I'd like to draw your attention also to another side of climate policy that is rarely spoken about. We talk a lot about supply, so supply of raw materials, supply of finished goods, supply of clean tech. Security of supply is important, but the demand side is also extremely important. For the first time in living memory, we are facing absolute resource constraints as human activity hits planetary boundaries. 
Um, we need to go beyond decarbonization to thinking also about dematerialization, which means reducing the, the amount of materials that we use and increasing resource efficiency in order to prevent um, uh, climate change because uh, a lot of emissions come from uh, resource use. In fact, uh, it's a third of global emissions come directly from resource use. Plus, of course, they have an, it has an enormous impact on freshwater use, pollution and other things. Um, this report, which I'll just uh, show you, you can find it online, uh, the International System Change Compass, which I wrote with Yanis Potochnik, the former Environment and Research Commissioner, sets out quite clearly um, the need to, uh, to, to improve resource efficiency in order to meet both our climate goals and also our economic policy goals. The situation we're in now, according to the UN's International Resource Panel, is that resource efficiency has not improved since 1970. In fact, we've tripled the number of natural resources that we consume as human beings from nature since 1970. So we've tripled since 1970. And if nothing changes, if resource efficiency remains the same, we will double the amount that we, the total amount we take from nature of everything, wood, uh, fossil fuels, but also um, metals, mining, um, the whole range of different uh, natural resources that, that we take, um, we, will, we will double it again by 2060. Um, and that means that total resource use is so far beyond planetary boundaries that it will definitely have an enormous impact on human health, um, as well as on um, things like the availability of pollinators to pollinate our agriculture, um, the uh, fresh water that we need to drink, as well as for uh, so many human activities and for industry and so on. And so far, public policy has paid very little attention to, attention to the demand side. Um, it's, we've, we're still very focused on the supply side um, and we need to get work out how we can improve the use of resources. Now, the good news is the UN will be reducing, uh, re producing a new international uh, global resource outlook. Sorry, the, the name of the report is the global resource outlook in 2024. Um, which will provide um, more data, but also more policy recommendations on how to increase resource efficiency. Um, and that brings me to the final point, which is really about the new metrics that we need. For the first time ever, we're starting to price environmental impacts into our economic systems. The EU has started with carbon pricing, but there are many other effects on the environment which lack metrics and which will be more complicated to price. Um, economists are used to classing whole um, categories of effects as externalities. And we've been uh, putting environmental externalities on the margins and not thinking about them um, for many decades. We now need to bring the externalities back in. Um, this goes beyond the idea of um, uh, moving towards well-being indicators. It's actually about um, trying to price in the impact on biodiversity, the impact on nature, the impact on fresh water. At the moment, we don't account for those things at all. Um, and this is a problem because if you don't uh, account for these things, if you don't put metrics on them, but don't put value on them, then when they start to disappear, um, then you are not aware of the risks that you're running um, and the problems that will be caused by uh, stress on, on all of these factors, which are essential for human health, but also essential for economic uh, activity. Uh, now, the European Central Bank has started looking at this issue. Um, they've done a study which shows that 75% of companies in the euro area are directly at risk um, of going bankrupt if they lose one or more ecosystem services. And these ecosystem services are not accounted for. They're not there in most of our metrics. Um, they are things like fresh water, they are things like pollination um, and so on. So um, our current system overvalues productive capital. It tends to undervalue human capital and it's still failing to value natural capital at all. So creating metrics and accounting mechanisms for valuing biodiversity, ecosystem services and so on is going to be a very important task, uh, probably one that the uh, EU institutions in their next term will take up. To, will, will take up. And that will in turn stimulate new economic sectors, um, which is really interesting, um, are going to create some very interesting opportunities uh, for investment, but also, and for, for business growth, but also going to take some adjustment. 
So um, I'll conclude there so that we still have a bit of time for uh, questions and, and discussion. Um, we're starting, we started this session actually half an hour after I was expecting it to start according to the agenda. So I can't stay uh, beyond um, half past. Uh, so apologies for that, but um, I gather that the agenda is running a bit late. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, 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 okay. Is around it, it's something very asymmetric in terms of uh, in terms of what's, who's causing the carbon emissions and um, the impact of uh, carbon emissions on, the, on, on different different countries and what needs to be done by different regions like developing countries as advanced countries. So this is, this asymmetry creates problems of um, uh, cohesion, problems of cooperation, problems of problems um, of of uh, working together for the objectives of. Um, Fighting climate change. So, uh, how do you how do you think we can go about addressing address, 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 consensus uh, in driving common objectives? It raises issues of justice and uh, funding, I suppose. Yes, uh, because I mean, what we've done so far with the European Green Deal is to look at the European economy and um, impressive progress has been made over the past five years. Um, if we achieve our, our emissions goals by 2030, the EU will be emitting less than 5% of global emissions. So we can congratulate ourselves and say, you know, well done, Europeans. Uh, we've really done our part. But to, to just look at the emissions that are produced on the territory of Europe does not take into account all of the embedded emissions, the emissions that are made elsewhere in the world to produce the goods that are imported into Europe. So if you look at our consumption, um, European imports account for a much larger percentage of emissions uh, globally, plus also embedded fresh water, embedded pollution, and so on. So we have to think about the way that our high consuming economy really has a major impact also in other regions. Um, but it also will have an, an impact on other regions as we move to a more circular economy, as we move to different models. Um, so that's a good thing. We need to do that. It's, um, I think, very encouraging that we are able to, to move uh, to greater circularity in Europe. But that will have an effect on our consumption and therefore on the other regions who have uh, targeted their production at our markets. So if you take, for example, the garment industry in Bangladesh, which uh, employs some four and a half million people, um, those people are making fast fashion, 90% um, of which is, is uh, destined for European markets. If we stop buying so much fast, fast fashion, which we need to do in order to reduce the, the impact on the environment, what are the jobs? What are going to be the livelihoods for those four and a half uh, million people. So that's where EU trade and especially development policies really need to adjust. Um, and we need to bring the Green Deal also into the external policies of the European Union and think about the impact that it's going to have on our international relationships and start working with those countries on how a circular economy can continue to have a positive and open um, set of economic relationships where we still have open trade, um, but where we take into account the, the big adjustment that's going to ha be, have to be made for the climate transition. I can take one question from the, uh, from the audience, if any. Yes. Um, a microphone, please. One question, yes. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for your well-conducted presentation. As mentioned previously, low economically developed countries are prone to avoid following suggested ideas in regards to preventing the ongoing process of climate change. However, it is known that they are some of the largest carbon emitting countries as renewable energy is not easily accessible for them. What measures do you think suggest can be done to help these countries reduce their carbon footprint and cooperate with the regulations imposed in order to help our planet? Thank you. Um, Heather? Shall I come back on that straight away? Okay, thank sure. you. This is an important question um, because uh, the the major um, rises in emissions, the major increases in emissions that we could expect over the next years 
um, won't be so much from the developed world, but more from de the developing world. Um, and that's understandable given um, that the emissions per capita in the developing world in the global south or what you might call the global majority countries, um, the emissions per capita are much lower there. For example, um, average emissions in the United States per American um, uh, you know, per capita, each American emits seven times as much as the average Indian. So this, there is a big issue of climate justice here. So it makes total sense for India to stop um, burning coal and to um, meet its energy needs through renewable energy. Um, but there's going to have to be a huge effort in order to um, make that substitution happen and ensure that uh, there, that uh, impoverishment and uh, industrial dislocation are not the results of that. So there's a justice element to this. There's also a very practical question of how to finance uh, renewable energies, as you rightly pointed out, um, because the climate finance is still um, uh, stuck in some quite old... Um, Sorry, I'm hoping you hear me now. Um, because climate finance is still stuck in, in some quite old paradigms. A shift is slow to happen. Um, the famous 100 billion for adaptation that was promised quite a few years ago now uh, to the developing world still hasn't been delivered. And that's for adaptation. That's not even for mitigation. And then when it comes to mitigation and uh, the crucial um, question of uh, how to, to build the new renewable um, it's vital that um, the, the multilateral development banks change a lot faster in, in terms of their, um, uh, their provision of that kind of finance, and also that um, the private sector is crowded into it too. And we don't yet have fully the mechanisms that are necessary. We're trying out some new things. Okay, um, I think um, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Heather, for your presentation and taking the questions. I think the road could be long and difficult to achieve our net, um, z uh, net zero emissions uh, targets by time 2050, uh, not least because of the things we must change, uh, change the energy base, change the technology, and change in economic models to work with at a time when the global community is so diverse, and uh, we are all starting from different points. So I thank you all for coming and joining the discussion, and uh, I pass on to the organization for the next session.